prep for password, and you know these these few things popped up. So, you know, starting off with the process, I found this uh, these API calls, and then I went even further and I found the, the function definitions, and I noticed that this is just in encrypting by an XOR and then hexifying it. So, I wrote a quick Python script to decrypt it. Um, so, you know, this is just basically showing how I, I took it in. So the first thing I did is I popped up IPython, import bin ASCII, unhexify it, and now I have the data to work with. So the next thing I do is I go through and I write the decryption implementation. Unfortunately, in this particular case, I made a mistake uh, because the output isn't le anything legible or anything that I can really use. So I went back and I reviewed, and I noticed, hey, I left the little tilde off for the unary stuff. So by implementing this stuff, or implementing this in IPython, or by prototyping this in IPython, I was able to quickly get something back without having to write a script, run a script, and having a non-interactive environment. So, you know, the whole premise was being able to write out a quick script, debug the code, very, de code the, debug the code very quickly, modify the functions as needed, and then move on to the next kill. So IPython was one of those interactive environments that helped give me this edge. So moving on to our second case study, uh, this goes back to when I was a pen tester again. Uh, one of the things I, I find a lot is that uh, you'll get a tough engagement. They've already patched everything before. It's the one time of the year that they manage to patch is right before the pen testers come in. They set ground rules. You can't bring in any zero days, and they make things basically impossible. So what I like to do is when you get in-house, look for some custom software, either something they wrote in-house or something that uh, they brought from a small vendor that caters to their particular industry. Um, and then I try to reverse that and find an exploit for it in a short amount of time. For small applications, this is pretty easy to do. I tend to like to focus on things that load in the browser. Uh, but you have some problems is that the modules are loaded as they're needed. You can run through hundreds of iterations. And if you're trying to do a full trace on this or if you're trying to uh, manually debug it, you're just going to spend far, far too much time. So I created some uh, add-ons to Immunity Debug. It's a nice interface. It's basically Ollie Debug um, with Python built in and a nice API. Um, so basically, I, it's, again, it's three quick scripts to do some lazy man tracing. Uh, if you were lucky enough and you had Ben Navi, you know, you might not need to do this, but you don't always have that. Uh, so basically what happened is that I identified the vulnerable code. I knew it was, it was happening because you had the crash there. Uh, and I wanted to develop some scripts that would sort of get me there so I could figure out exactly where the taint happened and work my way backwards. Um, now the initial thing was I could use load DLL hook, which is an API that's made available by Immunity Debugger, uh, but basically it didn't work. Uh, I had to use BP hook. I spent hours and hours trying to, trying to make this work. Uh, eventually the easiest way was just to go back and talk to Immunity. Uh, maybe they fixed it by now, but you know, as of a year or so ago, it was still broken. Uh, so here are two examples of the scripts. On the left hand side, it's just a, a script that, that's loaded in Immunity. It looks for all the modules loaded. And once it's there, uh, it sort of stalks and sets a breakpoint uh, for the particular module. Uh, the way it does it is on the right. Uh, basically, it finds a load library, both load library A and load library W, because uh, you might have the wide bytes. Uh, and just puts a, a hook on those functions. So anytime the module's loaded or unloaded in there, it basically says, OK, I'm going to set a breakpoint. And then you can use that inside the scripting to do your automated type stuff. So in this particular example, it was uh, inside a browser. It was a custom plugin that they were using. And it was loaded hundreds of times for each page that was there. So if you were doing this manually, or if you set uh, uh, Immunity Debugger to, lo load and to break on each module unloading, you'd just spend hours and hours. So this way, you did it in code. Um, it was much quicker. Uh, here's a bit more in depth of the, the class that you have to overload to be able to do that. Uh, basically, it's just using a variable to set a count uh, to how many times you're going to wait and let this load. So it's going to have hundreds of objects on a page. You know that it's not in the first 50. You iterate through. It's not in the first 100. Uh, so you keep upping that count. And eventually, you let it load and let it run. And let's say on the 205th time, you know this is the one you care about. You're there at the break point. You haven't spent hours and hours doing this stuff. And you can start debugging backwards by maybe doing a small trace there forward or manually reversing it. And here are two more examples. So, you know, if you're, you're still lazy um, and you want to do this all automated, maybe you want to let it run many, many times. You want to get a lot of variables information. So on the left, it's just dumping the uh, register values. On the right, it's just doing the, the call stack trace. Um, so basically, it's just doing light tracing. You know where the problem happens. You get the debugger to, to iterate through those hundreds of steps. And then you get it to dump the information that you care about at the last minute. 
that way you don't spend all your time there because you know you have other hosts to, to deal with, you have other things to break into. And basically what this enabled me to do was to fastly, uh, to quickly reverse um, and find the taint in some small stack overflow that was used in a browser that seemed like this really cool thing. So within a week I was able to find a problem and exploit it and you know gain further access into the systems based on a couple scripts. So the next, th next case we're going to talk about is uh, IDA, IDA Pro scripting. <clears throat> in this particular case, IDA Pro offers you IDA Python, which is a Python environment that you get to run Python code in. You can't prototype outside of it, so you have to do it in a very piecewise uh, fashion. Uh, and that kind of it hinders the debugging process, and it's also not very straightforward about how to get around. So the trick is, you know, writing small little scriptlets so that you can get to the point where you're actually doing something interesting. So this basic example is actually uh, comes from uh, an elf header parser I had to do in order to update the relocatables in uh, the elf header that I was I was looking at for an ARM binary. So basically, as I said, I had to do it piece by piece. Uh, one of the big things about uh, IDA Pro is when you're running, uh, or one of the one of the, the crazy things about IDA Pro, or the one more uh, the more unforgiving things is if you run a if you run an IDA Python. IDA Python script and you start stomping around your IDB, there's no control C, there's no, there's no going backwards. So there's no real undo. So you want to make sure what you're doing is, is effective, uh, at least in the, the first or two iterations with, you know, small, small uh, function calls or whatever. So in this particular case, I wrote this, this basic function that would parse out the E header and give me a nice clean looking ELF header. Uh, unfortunately, when I did this, I had a, a bug in it and I wouldn't have caught it and it could have resulted in a more potentially disastrous uh, outcome where I would have to revert back to my original IDB. And if I hadn't backed it up, that means I have to start all over after I've marked stuff up. So in this case, I, I kind of illustrate that, you know, file start wasn't initialized in this particular function that I'm calling. And so it could have been anything. So it could have been in the middle of the IDB. And so if that was the case, then I would have just stomped out any, any code or comments that I would have put in there. So as I said, there were, there's no control Z, so there's no going back. So the whole idea is to implement your code in small segments and then do it iteratively as you work through the pro process. So after I, after I fixed a sm small little bug, I was able to get an elf header. Surprise. Yay. So the next case that we're going to talk about is code writing code. This is one of the things I don't see uh, emphasized enough when people are doing software development. So the idea is to write little scripts that write C code or write Python code for you. Uh, what this generally entails is you write a whole bunch of definitions for commands or uh, messages or you want to script it in some way so that you don't have to write all of the commands or messages for like a string. The best way to do it is write a script that's going to do it for you. That helps speed up the development process and you don't have to spend all that time, uh, you know, going through, typing it in and possibly making typos. Additionally, you can actually reuse the script later on if you decide that you want to make some changes. So in this particular case, I had all these definitions that I wanted to, first of all, uh, export to, to Python, and then second of all, make uh, string definitions. So this is actually kind of a lot of stuff to do for one person. It's, it kind of drives me nuts when I have to go back and do stuff like this because I'd rather do stuff like solve a problem, not do data entry. So in this particular case, I used IPython again. I, I busted out, uh, I basically busted out all the, all the lines, and then I went through each definition and I saw if it had an underscore or not. And if it had an underscore, I put an S in front of it. And then from there, I get this nice little output where I get the, the pound def, the, the string underscore BP hit, and then I get a string that represents that command in a lowercase fashion. Now, doing all the data entry for me is kind of boring. Uh, some people might like to do it because that's what they do, but I figured this would be really interesting, or not really interesting, but really useful because I don't want to have to do this ever again. I just want to be able to plug something in, run it, check it over real quick, and then plop it into my source code. Additionally, with uh, doing stuff in Python, we're exporting the Python. In Python, I realized that I wanted to change the case convention of everything I was and use a more standard uh, development convention so that if I ever gave this code to anybody, they would understand what's going on. So I basically went through and I lowercase everything and put it into or I just modified it, did a quick update without actually having to go through and correct the case for everything. So the final case is uh, more to do with adding functionality to uh, an external library. And this kind of goes back to the whole use open source model. So what happened was I needed to 
well, what I was trying to do is I was trying to model the communication, I was trying to get the communication to work between uh, my, my debuggers and IDA Pro. The thing is, I was doing all this in C++. Anyone who's developed in C++ or done C, C++ development, realizes it gets really tedious and it gets really difficult to implement stuff. I wanted to use Python. But in order to use IDA Python uh, with, uh, with my plugin, I would have to use an external language call. And then once I do the external language call, I don't actually get the side effect of when I ran my, my command. So what I really wanted was I wanted to be able to load IDA Python and with my, the IDA Python DLL or the, the module into my code so that I could actually make those functions calls. But IDA Python doesn't really allow this naturally, so I had to go through and add my own exports. And so by adding my own exports, I not only saved time up front because I was able to now use Python in my application, but I also saved time because I, I can use Python. I can prototype in Python. I can write, you know, 100 plus lines of code for every, you know, three or four lines of C++ code that I have to write and debug. Or that's an exaggeration. But you get the hope. I hopefully you get the point that, you know, using higher level languages is a lot easier than using lower level languages. So now all I have to do is import the, the module into my code and call the function and, you know, life is great. Life is easy. Okay, so now we're going to actually talk about um, RE Bridge. It was originally called IDA Bridge. The basic idea is started, we have all of our debuggers. We, everybody seems to use IDA, but you might prefer a Muni debugger, you might prefer a WinDebug, and uh, you can't get things to talk. Sure, IDA has its own debuggers in it, but they're, they're pretty terrible to use. At least I find them terrible to use. So you, you have your own debugger that you have all your scripts for. You have, uh, you're just used to doing it with it, and you just want to convert things back over to IDA sometimes. Uh, so basically, you just want the tools to be able to talk to each other. Uh, so originally it was IDA Bridge, but then we, we thought, okay, well, all these tools might want to talk to each other. A lot of the scripts we, we showed you before were, you know, sort of reversing type things. But it mainly stemmed around, they didn't talk to each other. You need to get information from one source to the other. And RE Bridge is sort of hoping to do this. Uh, so it's trying to fill a very specific gap. It's basically middleware. It's nothing super exciting, but it lets your tools talk to each other. So if you have breakpoints set in IDA, you can push them over to WinDebug, or you can move data back and forth between them. So it just makes things a little bit easier. So like Matt was saying, RE Bridge is a middleware. It's not, it's not meant to be an implementation for another reverse engineering tool. It's not meant to do you know, X, Y, and Z. It's meant to f fill a gap, give you a server that's, that sits between, or a server and a client that sits between your IDA Pro and your debugger, or you know, hopefully in the future, debugger or a fuzzer, and then they can communicate with each other. They can send each other messages, and they all understand the messages. And so basically no one's reinventing new tools, they're just reinventing a communication stack. So, like we said, it's the, the whole idea is to make the tools interact with each other, give users the ability to control their tools from one tool or another, and then also build it out as a distributed framework so that way you don't have to reverse from on the same machine. So if, say, I'm using IDA Pro on my, primary, on my Windows machine and I'm reverse engineering a Linux machine, I don't have to use, uh, I don't have to use VMware. I can just put it on a remote hardware somewhere and just make them talk across the network. Um, and of course, Immunity, or IDA Pro does have the debugger functionality written into it, but if anyone's ever tried to use a debugger, it's very difficult to understand. It's, it's difficult to use and get set up in the initial stages. So having something where you can just use a native debugger that you're always used to and not having to use you know, somebody else's GUI or somebody else's being constrained to somebody else's tool that you don't appreciate is, is, is a huge plus. And the additional thing that we want to do is we want to make this middleware extendable. Uh, we want to make the middleware extendable using stuff like Python or, or Ruby. So we have several components that, we, that we've built out so far. The first one is the IDA bridge. It's basically a command line interface that uses an asynchronous server or networking client that we pulled from Collaborate. Again, we're emphasizing that you should use open source tools or open source software that's already implemented stuff to, wrap, to incorporate into your, your software. And then what we did is we modified the IDA Python lib so that way we don't have to go through and rewrite everything in C or C++ to do the actual interfacing with, with, uh, with IDA Pro. We can just rely completely on Python. Uh, and that also gave us another one because we can extend our Python classes, or we can extend our handler classes using Python. So if we want to add a new command, we just write a new uh, Python class with the defined command elements, and then we just roll from there. Um, so we also use, we also for this implementation, uh, incorporated v, Vtrace or uh, VDB 
which is a, a, a product of, of Concerto and a Visigoth.